The idea of this talk is I'd like to give an introduction to some of the methods that we use in data science and their role in digital engineering, particularly in this key issue of uncertainty quantification for inverse problems. And I'm going to be presenting some joint work with my PhD student here in Wollongong, Matt Berry, as well as his other supervisors, Mark and Brian, and our collaborator, Raymond Longbottom. So I'm gonna start very generally with a mathematical model. And I'd like you to think of F as your favorite equation, whatever that might be. I'm going to show some illustrative examples in this talk. But these principles apply very generally across a bunch of different problems in oceanography, hydrodynamics, geotechnics, and structures, and so on. Now, this function f doesn't need to be available in closed form. In fact, it's often the solution to some kind of numerical model. So for example, we might have a system of differential equations that we're solving numerically, and that then gives us our value of the function f. And as far as the parameters go, right now you might be tuning these by hand or selecting them based on values that other people have used in the literature. Um, but you might be curious about whether we can learn these parameters from data. So that's the idea in data science. We're going to have some observations of the real world system at some times or perhaps some spatial locations or perhaps both. And we believe that these observations are going to match our mathematical description, but then this data are inherently noisy. So the first example that I'm going to show is this growth curve. And in this case, we can actually solve this equation analytically. And so this is our function f. And we're going to observe that at these time points t1 up to tn. And then the initial value of this function is just going to be alpha minus beta. And we have observations to go along with that. And we're going to assume a normal distribution so that we have additive Gaussian noise. And the unknown parameters in this case that we're trying to learn include the parameter associated with our initial value and the parameter that's associated with our noise. So it isn't just the parameters of our equation that we're learning. It can be other things as well, like tuning parameters. So this is the observed data. Um, it's measurements of the length of some dugongs and then the age of those animals. And we can fit this model using nonlinear least squares. So here I'm using Gauss-Newton, um, but for example, you might be using uh, levenberg markhart or a quasi-Newton method. And the advantage of these deterministic algorithms it, is that they are very hard, fast. And most of the time, they do give us a pretty good um, idea of that mean function. Um, so if we're mainly interested in the mean, then um, these methods are very good and very widely used. But there's a couple of drawbacks. One is that it's very hard to know if you have a convex optimization problem or not. And so your algorithm might only be giving you the nearest local optimum of the function, 
And so the results that you get are going to be completely dependent on the initial values that you use to start the algorithm off. The other issue and the main issue that I'll be concerned with in this talk is that those standard errors on the previous slide are systematically underestimated. So if we want to build confidence intervals for alpha and beta, those parameters, then our 95% CIs in a simulation study are only achieving about 83% coverage of those true parameter values. So an inverse problem is where we're trying to find the parameter values, and here I'm just using a vector theta, that are consistent with our observations Y. And our physical model then um, doesn't need to be invertible. So although it's called an inverse problem, we never actually invert this function f. Um, although there is an issue with identifiability of our parameters, which can then lead to multimodality in our distribution of those parameters. But there is current research in how to address this issue of multimodality. And that's one of the things I've been working on um, and I plan to work with, work on in Tide. And then our statistical approach is based on this likelihood function where the mean of our random variable is just equal to the solution of our numerical model. And then we have some random noise that doesn't necessarily need to be Gaussian, although that's what I'm using in these examples because it's certainly easier if we can assume the normal distribution, but we can do this much more generally. So we need to assign prior distributions on all of our parameters. Now I've chosen very simple priors here. So I'm specifying the boundaries of these parameters. So alpha and beta need to be strictly positive. So I'm specifying a prior on the log scale and then gamma needs to be between zero and one. So I'm using the logit transform of gamma um, to go from a zero one to a um, unbounded uh, parameter space. And then here I'm just using these normal distributions to give very mild regularization to those parameter estimates. For a better way to set priors for these types of things, I highly recommend the paper by Lachlan and Ed in 2018, where they really go through in a lot of detail and use a really gold standard approach to set priors for mid ocean parameters specifically. Um, but in this case, I'm just using something quite simple um, as an illustrative example. Our posterior distribution for our parameters is then going to come from Bayes' rule. So here we have our likelihood that I showed earlier multiplied by our prior. And on the denominator, we have this horrible integral that we don't ever want to evaluate. So instead we're going to use Monte Carlo methods. And the algorithm that I'm using in this case is a random walk metropolis. And so we start off our algorithm by initializing from those prior distributions that I showed earlier. And then we're going to propose new parameter values just using a Gaussian random walk on that unconstrained parameter space. We in this case, we are solving our 
numerical model at every iteration. So if you're cringing at the thought of having to do that in a loop hundreds or even thousands of times, there are more advanced methods for mitigating this cost and reducing the number of evaluations of our function that we need to do. But in this simple case, I'm just going to solve the function. In this case, it's I, I know the analytic solution. Um, so that's, for me, that's actually quite fast. Um, this is a conditional linear model. So for the noise parameters, I can actually, rather than doing a random walk, I can do a different proposal from this inverse gamma distribution. And then I'm calculating the log likelihood using that mean, um, which is the solution of our function, and then that noise parameter. And finally, we're just going to accept or reject um, those pr proposed parameter values using this probability that we calculate here. So this gives us some Markov chains and the advantage of this approach is that these Markov chains will eventually forget where they started from. So we don't have that dependence on our initial conditions that we have with those deterministic optimization methods. And we obtain posterior distributions for all of our parameters that encode not only our best guess at the parameter, but also the range of likely values for each of these parameters. Now, I mentioned that the deterministic algorithms are very good at estimating the mean, but you'll notice that this distribution alpha has is very heavy tailed and skewed. And our distribution of gamma is negatively skewed. And this has big implications when we're trying to estimate things like probabilities of exceedances and extreme values. It matters a lot what's happening in the tails of these distributions. And so these MCMC methods are a much better way of characterizing that tail behavior. From our posterior distributions, which are this blue line here, we can then get predictions for other values of, in this case, at other time points. And so these red dashed um, intervals are, are predictive intervals from our model. I'm going to sort of skim through the other example. Now, this is a um, more recent example of the use of these inverse Bayesian inverse problems methods in an industrial context. So we have a chemical reaction here that's following this Arrhenius um, equation. So we have the change in mass over time. Then we have the change in temperature over time. And this is a controlled experiment. So we're increasing the temperature at some fixed rate alpha. The parameters that we're trying to figure out uh, what's called this pre-exponential factor A and the activation energy E in particular. Again, I'm going to be assuming Gaussian noise and this variance parameter is also going to be included in this vector theta. So we have good prior information for the activation energy, because this is physically interpretable, and we have pretty good prior information for our noise, because that's mostly based on the instrument that we're using to make these measurements. But we don't have a good prior for this pre-exponential factor A, 
So instead we introduce this other parameter that I'm going to call T max, which is the temperature at which the rate of the uh, reaction is maximized. And this is an example where we don't have our function in closed form. And so we're using Runge Kutta algorithm to solve our equation given some proposed parameter values for E and A. And then we use that same random walk MCMC algorithm that I showed on the previous slide. And that gives us posterior distributions for that T max and for the activation energy. We then calculate A just as a function of those other parameters. And we also get an estimate for the noise. I mentioned calculating a function of our parameters, and this is another advantage of that Bayesian approach. So once we have our posterior distribution for our parameters of our model, we can then obtain predictions for any other function of those parameters that we choose to evaluate. And the main one in this context is the critical length of a stockpile of the material that's in one dimension or in three dimensions, we'd have the critical volume of material. And so we can evaluate that function for all of our MCMC samples. And that then gives us a posterior distribution for the value of that function. In this case, the critical length. So that's about all the time that I've got. Um, but this is only the start of the types of Bayesian methods that can be used. Um, in particular, David Gunawan in Wollongong has done a lot of great work in sequential Monte Carlo methods and also in approximate likelihood methods using things like approximate Bayesian computation and pseudo-marginal methods. And as most of us know, Andrew has done a lot of great work in spatiotemporal models and also in emulation of the function. So that's one way that we can reduce how many function evaluations or how many times we need to solve a numerical model in order to calculate our posterior distribution. So thanks everybody.